Now, what I want to do is go over these two reactions again, the Tollens reagent and the Benedict's um, reagent. And basically, these are um, oxidation reduction reactions. Remember now, with oxidation reduction, oxidation is the loss of an electron or the loss of a hydrogen atom. That distincts um, what an oxidation. Reduction is the opposite. It would be gaining an electron or gaining a hydrogen. Okay, so we have, and remember, uh, aldehydes and ketones both can be oxidized. What's wrong with that statement? Remember, ketones cannot be oxidized, only aldehydes. So that's one test that'll distinguish an aldehyde from a ketone is you try oxidizing it. For example, here, we have two solutions. One is acetone, which is the simplest ketone on the left. And then we have uh, benzaldehyde, uh, an aromatic uh, aldehyde on the right. So this would be aldehyde ketone. So we're gonna put an oxidizing agent in there, potassium dichromate. Now you don't have to worry about potassium dichromate. All you need to know is it's an oxidizing agent. That means it's gonna oxidize something if, if it can. If it's oxidizing something, it's gonna change color to indicate that the reaction happened. So when we dump in that oxidizing agent into the ketone and into the aldehyde, Two things happen, nothing here and there. So the fact is that as soon as this changed color to this kind of a grayish green or grayish blue, we know that a reaction took place. And since it's an oxidizing agent, that means a reaction took place. Now, if this was an unknown, we would know then that the test tube here got oxidized. And if we were testing for aldehydes, ketones, we know that then this would be an aldehyde. Nothing happened here because the color didn't change. It's still that orangey color. So we know that it, whatever was in there could not be oxidized. And if we knew a ketone was in there versus an aldehyde, we know then it was the ketone since they cannot be oxidized. All right, as far as these reactions go, okay, Tollens, you need to know this. This is gonna be used in carbohydrate chemistry as well. The deal here is we have silver cation plus one. Now it's gonna be the oxidizing agent. That means if it oxidizes something, it's going to be reduced. So it gets reduced to silver metal. If this gets reduced, something has to be oxidized. In this case, it's the aldehyde get oxidized and it goes all the way to the acid salt. The reason why it's an acid salt is because It's an alkaline or basic solution. An acid in an alkaline or basic solution loses its hydrogen and becomes a salt, the acid salt. Okay, so what happens is the reaction converts that silver ion to metallic silver. So the inside of the test tube is all shiny. Looks just like a mirror. It's really a cool reaction. You need to know this reaction because we're gonna apply this to sugar solutions. And there's a term called reducing sugar. 
And the reducing sugar will actually cause itself to be oxidized and reduce something else. And that's a key identifier in carbohydrate chemistry. Is it a reducing sugar? And you'll see when we get into the meat of carbohydrates, what that means. And basically, carbohydrates are cyclic most of the time. The other times, they open up. And they open up to expose either a ketone or an aldehyde. When they open up to expose the aldehyde, they're susceptible to being oxidized. Hence, those are the reducing sugars. Some sugars are not reducing sugars. They don't. They may open up, but they don't open up to an aldehyde. Okay, so that's reaction number one. Tollens reagent. Basically, I want you to know it in this form rather than that form. Okay, I want you to be really obvious that it's re re oxidation reduction. Okay. The same reaction happens with something called Benedict's solution. Only instead of silver, we're taking copper plus two, and it's being reduced to copper plus one. It's losing its charge from plus two to plus one. That means it's gaining an electron. Okay, that means something has to be oxidized. The aldehyde then is oxidized to the, again, the acid salt. Because it's a basic environment again. Okay. So this is the other reaction you need to know. Now, the reaction itself isn't too bad. When we get a carbohydrate in there, carbohydrates are complex structures. And you need, you're going to be learning quite a few of these structures. And you, you're going to find out that they open up, like I was saying earlier. When they open up, they're going to expose either a ketone or an aldehyde. And that needs to be part of your Benedict's and Tollens reactions. Okay, aldehydes and ketones can also undergo reduction. When an aldehyde is reduced, what happens is that carbonyl group goes to an alcohol. and either ketone or an aldehyde. Now, in either one of these cases, the backbone is maintained. So if we start with a three carbon backbone, we're gonna end with a three carbon backbone. Same if it's oxidized. If we start with a three carbon backbone, it's gonna end with a three carbon backbone. And these, now, today I want to get into what happens when we take an alcohol and an aldehyde together, or an alcohol and a ketone together. Okay. So when we take an aldehyde and an alcohol together, we form something called a hemiacetal. And then what happens is it continues to react to form an acetal. So the hemi, we're gonna have two of these. We're gonna have a hemiacetal and a hemiketal. One starts with a ketone, one starts with an aldehyde. Now, the way I teach everyone how to identify whether it's a hemiacetal, acetal, hemiketal, or ketal is 
does does an OCO exist? Okay, step number one. If it is yes, then it is one of these four. Hemiketal, ketal, acetal, or hemiacetal. Okay. Okay, so you got the OCO test. So Yes or no. If it's yes, then it's one of the four. Hemiacetal, hemiketal, ketal, or acetal. Number two, is there an OH present on that carbon? If there is, then it's a hemi something. If not, then it's a acetal or a ketal. Number three, is there a hydrogen present on that carbon? If yes, then it's an acetal, either hemiacetal or acetal. If no, then it's a hemiketal or a ketal. So let's look at an example here. All right, so we're starting with So we're starting with a aldehyde. And we're throwing into that an alcohol. And we're going to form something. What happens is that alcohol attaches to the carbon that's bonded, double bonded to the oxygen, the carbonyl carbon. So that's where this here is. Now, we've got a new compound form. We have an OCO. So let's analyze that, okay? So number one is yes. Number two, is there an OH present? Yes. That means it's a hemi something. Number three, is there a hydrogen present? Yes, that means it's an acetal. So, so that means it's a hemi acetal. Now, what happens if there's still alcohol around, it'll continue to react and add another alcohol to this carbon here. So you'll end up with two of the original alcohols attached to that original carbon that's on the carbonyl. So
Okay, so number one, OCO, OCO. So it's one of them. Number two, is there a hemi, excuse me, is there an OH present? No, that means it's not a hemi. Okay, is there an H present? Yes, that means it's an acetal. Okay, so that's how to analyze, because on the test, I'm gonna ask you, what are, I'm gonna give you some chemicals. What are these? And you have to apply that, those three steps. Is there an OCO present? If there's no OCO, it's not any of those. You've got to have the OCO present. And we're going to find we get into carbohydrates. Most of them have an OCO present. For example, if we look at glucose. This is alpha glucose, okay? So we have OCO right there. So let's apply the same set of rules. Number one, yes, there's an OCO. Number two, is there an OH? Yes, then it's a hemi. Number three, is there an H present? Yes or no? Remember how many bonds does carbon have? Four. So we go one, two, three, fourth bond is a hydrogen. So that means this is a hemi acetal. Now, what's important about that is that notice those are double arrows. So if you form a hemi acetal, it can revert back to the aldehyde and alcohol or go on and be further oxidized. So, that means that glucose can open up to its aldehyde and alcohol version. So that's what glucose looks like opened up. So it goes from a hemiacetal to the aldehyde and alcohol from which it was made. Now you're gonna see this reaction a lot in carbs. Every monosaccharide, glucose, galactose, manna, all these are hemiacetals. Disaccharides, sucrose, lactose, these are all hemiacetals that can open and close, open and close. Okay. Um, 
Okay, now this is the mechanism and we're not gonna do mechanisms in here. Okay, so let's look at a ketone now. It's a very similar reaction. Okay, so instead of an aldehyde, it's a ketone. Okay, you have a ketone in the presence of an alcohol. What happens is you form an intermediate hemiketal. And then that goes on to further react to a full-blown ketal. So again, we use the same rules. The OCO, number one. Number two, is there an OH present? Number three, is there an H present? Okay, so let's look at an example. Here we've got a simple ketone, acetone, throw in an alcohol. In this case, it's ethanol, two carbon alcohol. So this alcohol is going, going to attach to that carbon there, which is right here now. And then if you, if it's in the presence of yet another alcohol, now this could be a different alcohol, by the way. Now remember, carbohydrates are alcohols. They're a combination of an alcohol and either a ketone or an aldehyde, which could be cyclic or open. So when carbs are around, there's a lot of hydroxyl groups around. So this aldehyde could hook up with another alcohol. Okay, This, uh, this aldehyde here could hook it up with another simple sugar, like galactose, or another glucose, because they have alcohol groups on them. Okay, so let's look at this here. Let's apply our, our test. Is OCO present? Yes, we have OCO. Number two, is OH present? Yes. That means it's a hemi something. Number three, is there an H present? No. So we have hemi, ketal. And that's for that guy. Now let's look at this one here. Uh, we have O, C, O, so that's yes. Number two, is there an OH present? No. That means it's not a hemi something. Number three, is H present? No. Hence, it's a ketone. Three steps every single time.
So this is a typical test question, is identify these. Is this a hemi ketal, hemi acetal, acetal, or ketal? Go through the three steps. OCO present, yes or no? OH present, yes or no? H present, yes or no? And it'll define it as to what it is. Now, I already told you that glucose is a hemiacetal. And the reason why you always see glucose cyclic, because hemiacetals are not particularly stable, but glucose is very stable. The reason for that is it's cyclic. And because it's cyclic, it's more stable if it's in the cyclic form rather than the open form. But it still opens up. It just spends most of its time closed. So this, and that's starting to look a lot like a sugar. The only difference between this here and glucose are four hydroxyl groups. That's the only difference. The only difference. So we've almost made a carbohydrate. Almost. Okay. Um, Hemi acetals are not particularly stable. So what happens, they frequently revert back to the original aldehyde and alcohol. Hemi ketals, not particularly stable. So they frequently revert back to the original ketone and alcohol. So again, it's a two-way street here. Now, the tricky part is synthesizing these little guys. Because you've got, got to take this thing apart because you're going to have two backbones in these guys. Now, this part here is what's being added to your unit one flowchart. So then we have aldehydroketone plus an alcohol. We'll end up with the intermediate hemi, and then it goes to a acetal or a ketal as the reaction further completes. Um, Formaldehyde is the simplest aldehyde. Acetone is the simplest ketone, both of which are bad for you. I mentioned this on Tuesday, um, last Thursday. Small aldehydes, small ketones are not good for you. That's what the problem when you drink alcohol, because your liver detoxifies the alcohol by first creating an aldehyde. And then it takes that aldehyde and converts it to an acid by oxidizing it. The problem is if you're lacking that enzyme to convert the aldehyde to the acid, that aldehyde can create problems, also known as cirrhosis of the liver. So aldehydes in general are very unstable and they tend to just react. Ketones and aldehydes are very present in biological molecules. Um,
and you've got a um, ketone here on the left, ketone on the left, uh, ketone on the left, alcohol on the right. In foods, there's a lot of very aromatic compounds, fragrant ones. In fact, we're going to be, so we did in lab this week, we made one, and they're frequently an aldehyde or ketone, frequently. And when you cook, there's something called the browning reaction or the Maillard reaction. That's what happens when you uh, expose protein and a sugar together under heat. It starts browning, hence the name browning reaction. And that tastes good until it turns black. So when it turns black, it's no longer an aldehyde or a ketone. It turns to pure carbon, which is not very good for you. Flowers. When I first started graduate school, the first thing uh, you do is you pick out something called a principal investigator. So you go around and basically talk to all the professors what their research is. And then if you're interested in their research, then you talk to them about being a possible graduate student. Then your next question is, do they have money? No money means they cannot pay you to be a TA or an RA. RA stands for research assistant. That means all you do is you do research and you get paid for it. A TA that you have, you have then you have to teach labs. And so those are the questions you do. The first guy I talked to was a guy, I walked into his lab and he had a big bell jar and he had a bouquet of roses underneath it. And he was analyzing the fragrances coming off of the roses with a machine called a gas chromatograph. And he ended up with 2,000-ish different compounds that made up the fragrance of a rose. That's why it's hard to make imitation rose fragrance, because it's very complex. And I wanted to work for him a lot. He had no money, though. <laughs> so I did not work for him. I ended up working for a dairy chemist who had money and was also using instrumentation. So I wanted instrumentation. Um, and, a, uh, and an RA ship, so I didn't have to be a TA. But anyway, um, that was pretty cool. He had, um, in those days, nothing was digital. This is in the, in the early 70s. Nothing was digital. Everything was paper. So they have something called a strip chart recorder with a little needle on it. And as the stuff is coming off column, the needle will go up and down on the paper. So you can get it, and then you can determine... Uh, you can run standards to it to determine what is in there. This paper was about 100 feet long, but all these compounds coming off. It was pretty wild. It's really cool. Um, anyway, um, so once we get into uh, aldehydes and ketones, because they're they're volatile, that's what really really lends itself to both flavors and fragrances. Okay, um, let's do now some um, synthesis. Okay, so let's take Okay, this is propanal, three carbon aldehyde. And let's add to that a two carbon alcohol. And don't forget now, the aldehyde has got a hydrogen here. 
Okay, so what's going to happen is Oops. Okay, the carbon with the OH attached is going to attach to the carbon of the aldehyde. So let's identify a couple things here. You have to identify first the backbone of the aldehyde or ketone. Secondly, you need to identify the backbone of the alcohol you're adding to it, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to end up creating a hemiacetal in this case, because we're starting with an aldehyde. And then what's coming off of that carbon, this carbon here, is going to be where the alcohol attaches. Okay, so you identify what you start with as the main backbone. And then you're adding alcohols to the carbon. Now there's a fancy name for this carbon over here. And they talk about it in the carbohydrate chapter, but basically Well, the anomeric carbon. And that's where all the action takes place when you're dealing with acetals, ketals, hemiacetals, and hemiketals is on the anomeric carbon. When I showed you glucose earlier, the spot that the glucose opens up is the anomeric carbon as well. So that anomeric carbon is really the key place on these reactions. Okay, so this is the anomeric carbon right here. Now, Remember, it's two-way. So this can be broken up into the original aldehyde and alcohol, or it can continue to react. So if there's another alcohol around, it doesn't have to be the same type. In other words, it doesn't have to be ethanol. It could be methanol, or it could be glucose. It can continue to react. Because this is the hemi- Acetyl. Okay, so we have OCO. We have yes or OH present. And we have
Yes, with a hydrogen present. Hence, it's a hemiacetal. So that means hemi And because the H is present, it's an acetal. Okay, well, let's continue this on. So we're going to continue this, and we're going to add another ethanol. So what's going to happen now is this guy is again going to attach to the anomeric carbon. So we still have the original yellow backbone. Let's see. Let's do this one together here. Um, so we're going to add that ethanol. So now we're going to have two alcohol extensions coming off of that original anomeric carbon. So we've got the backbone. That always remains. The original aldehyde or ketone backbone remains throughout this reaction. Okay, and this is what we started with. We started with the hemiacetal. So this was the original alcohol that was attached. And now we've got another one Here. So we have, so what is it? Is it a ketal, acetal, amiacetal? Okay, so I'll just go through the steps again. So yes, OCO, OCO. No, OH, that means it's not a hemi. Is there a hydrogen present? Yes. There's a hydrogen right there. So that means it's an acetal. So to name this guy, we would name it by calling it propane three three carbon backbone. Let me see. Let's move this over here a little bit. Here. Let's have some room. And we have one, two, three. So we have one one di ethoxy propane. Now I'm not going to have you name these guys. Um, you are going to have to name the aldehydes and ketones, but not the acetals or ketals. Okay, so are there any questions about this reaction?
And again, this is the essence of carbohydrate chemistry. Because instead of an aldehyde, we're going to have an opened up sugar. Instead of an alcohol, we're going to have another carbohydrate. And this is how we get chains of simple sugars together. Starch, for example, is a polysaccharide. Poly meaning more than 10. Illegal saccharides are from one to, excuse me, from uh, two to 10. Disaccharides are two, monosaccharides are one. How we chain them together is this reaction. You're going to see this reaction over and over and over again. Okay. So let's see. Two is it one twenty? All right. So are there any questions about this guy? Okay, so when we're dealing with these acetals and ketals, there are two backbones. You have the backbone of the original aldehyde or ketone plus the backbone of the attaching alcohol. When they combine, you need to discriminate between which is which, which was the original aldehyde and which was the original alcohol backbone. That's why I did it in different colors. The original alcohol are the ones that have the O something with them. Was that originally a methanol? I mean, a um, methanol group, ethyl group, propanol. Okay, so let's take this reaction and go backwards now. Let's start with Okay, what happens when this starts to break apart? What do you end up with? Well, let's look. Okay. So first of all, what is it? Is it an acetal, ketal, hemiacetal, or hem hemiketal? So we have OCO, so that means one is yes. Two, uh, do we have an OH present? No. That means it's not a hemi. Number three is H present. There's an H right there, so yes. That means it's a acetal. Okay, an acetal is created from an aldehyde originally. So this is going to break down. I'm going to end up generating an aldehyde and some alcohol. Okay, so we need to break down. What was what is the backbone of the original aldehyde? It's what the anomeric carbon is attached to. That there. So what the two oxygens are attached to, that's the anomeric carbon. That's the original aldehyde. Okay, so step number one is remove one of the alcohols. So let's remove the, oh, let me do one other thing here. So that's the backbone of the alcohols. So the first step, is removing one of those alcohols. So what do you end up with? Well, you always end up with the original backbone of the aldehyde. 
three carbons plus one of the alcohols. And then we have um, And again, that's the anomeric carbon. Okay, so this is o OCO. Yes, there's an OH present, so it's a hemi something. And number three, there's an H present, so it's a hemi acetal. And then this would be one of the alcohols that comes off. Now, if these were different alcohols stuck onto that anomeric carbon, you could end up with two different alcohols. In this case, they were the same original alcohol. So we're going to end up with two methanols. Okay, so we're going to continue on. And we're gonna, now we're going to generate the original aldehyde. And we're going to kick off the other alcohol. Anomeric carbon. Plus, we're going to end up with two of these methanols now. So, do we have OCO here? No. So it's neither an acetal or ketal, it's just a plain old aldehyde. The anomeric carbon is here, attached to the double bonded oxygen. Now we get into carbohydrates. Um, the structures are going to seemingly complicate these reactions. But it's the same reactions. It just has junk tagging along with it. Because we could take an illegal saccharide that's 40 glucoses long. And at the end of that illegal saccharide is a glucose that can open up. Once it opens up, it's an aldehyde then, and it can attach to other alcohols, which could be another carbohydrate, could be another long chain carbohydrate. Alcohols are all over the place in carb chemistry. Okay. Um, let's do one more example. Let's take apart a ketal this time. So well, let's see, let's go like this. Okay, again, I'm putting a big dot where the anomeric carbon is, that's where the oxygens are attached. So let's 
first identify what this is. Well, here's the backbone that contains the anomeric carbon in yellow. And this pinkish color are the backbones of the alcohols from which this was created. Okay, so what is this guy? Okay, number one, we have OCO. So it's something. Is there an OH present? Mm -hmm. No. So it's not a hemi. Is there a hydrogen present? No. So that means it's a key tau. Okay, key tails are made originally from a ketone. So that means that that original backbone is comes from a ketone. That means it has to include the anomeric carbon. So it's a little longer. Okay, and in pink are the two alcohols used to create this. So when this degrades, it kicks off one alcohol, then it kicks off the other alcohol. Okay, so the backbone remains the same. So we start with the backbone, which is a one, two, three, four carbon backbone. Anomeric carbon is still then the same place. And we're gonna have This thing keeps wanting to draw an arrow. It's not what I want. I want a line. Okay. And then this is gonna be an OH once the alcohol leaves. <laughs> so we have OCO, we have an OH present, so it's going to be a hemi and no hydrogen, so it's going to be a hemi ketal. And then this is going to be ethanol. And if we keep uh, taking this molecule apart, we're gonna end up with the same old backbone it contains the anomeric carbon. And we have the alcohol backbone. So when that alcohol, the second alcohol leaves, you're going to end up creating a ketone. Plus two. Plus two ethanols.
Now, this takes a bunch of practice. Bunch of practice. Um, and I tried to really point out, you have to identify the backbones. Now, when I was taking OCHEM, it's a, it's a year long class. And uh, at Davis, it's in quarter system. So there are three quarters of OCHEM. The last quarter is when we covered acetals and ketals. And that's when I came up with this system of highlighters back in 1972, I guess, when I took it. And um, a lot of people died in that class because of these guys. And I showed this system to a number of people in my study group, and they all did well. Um, and a friend of mine showed me this that had taken the course before, and then and she goes, "This is the way I do it," you know, and it made perfect sense to me. So I, I didn't say I'm stealing it from her, but adopted her <laughs> method. Really works well. So um, I'm going to leave you with one problem, and then see if you guys can come up with um, the answer. Okay. And that's what all I'm going to cover today. Okay, so. How do you make this? Let's see. I need to go. We'll go ahead and try making that. Huh? What? That better. I need to write with a thicker pen also. Identify the backbones of the alcohols and the original aldehyde or ketone. We'll go from there. 